All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got Jacob Sullum from Reason Magazine. Boy, do you write a lot of great stuff all the time. Welcome back to the show, Jacob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, so who knows what's coming up in the Congress? Uh, maybe you know that, too, at least the beginnings of it. But uh, they've gotten to start the Biden administration on the new gun control agenda. This one is called Joe Biden Learns to Love Gun Control by Presidential Fiat. And they announced, what, six different executive orders the other day? Or a six-point uh, six executive order, something like that? Six actions. They're not all executive orders. Okay. Um, and, and some of them are more problematic than others. All right. Well, take us through it. Okay. Well, the first thing I guess I should mention is that, uh, I mean, the reason for that headline is that uh, during a, a Democratic debate back in 2019, Biden actually uh, scolded uh, his his current vice president uh, for uh, Kamala Harris for saying that if Congress didn't act, she was prepared as president to unilaterally impose certain uh, forms of gun control. And he, he said at that time, uh, we've got a constitution, we should follow the constitution, you know, this is really up to Congress to uh, impose uh, new new restrictions on guns. Um, he seems to sort of have changed his mind um, <laughs> because uh, there have there are several proposals that are that ha that Congress is considering, um, um, some of which have been already approved by the House, but they it, it's uh, iffy as to whether uh, they're going to pass the Senate. So recognizing that he is now trying to do what what he thinks he can do. Um, on his own. Uh, so, so one of one of the the actions is has is the nomination of David Chipman, who is a former uh, BATF uh, official, but more recently has been a gun control activist uh, to head uh, the BATF. Um, and that the prospects for that, uh, you know, it's alarming to uh, gun rights supporters. Uh, Understandably so, uh, but the prospects for that are 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 also iffy in in the Senate. That's you know ha consists half of which consists of Republicans and also includes a few uh, at least a few Democrats who are uh, you know supporters of the Second Amendment. So that may be tough going. And by the way, uh, uh, on that point, real quick, can we talk about his role in Waco and what all you know about that? Because there's there's yeah, been a well, lot I mean, of of uh, speculation about this. I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that was odd is that he endorsed the idea that uh, the Branch Davidians had shot down uh, National Guard helicopters, which is not true. Um, so without delving into all the details uh, of Waco, which, you know, I wrote about a lot at the time, um, that's pretty important, you know, because that has to goes to how big a threat they presented and uh, whether the government response was appropriate. So the fact that he uh, seems to believe that thing, which is not true, is is sort of alarming. Mm -hmm. But and, I would. Uh, and then one more thing about that was, as far as I know, um, they say that he was a case agent involved in the prosecution of the court case later against the survivors. And I don't know of any other information than that. But I do want to mention, as long as we're talking about it, that there's some disinformation going around, too where there are trophy pictures of guys who are either FBI hostage rescue team or more likely Delta Force soldiers where they're posing over the smoldering corpses of the Davidians. And there are people passing that around and saying that's him. And uh, so I just that, wanted to warn people yes. that that's not really right. If it was, there would be a link that proves it. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yeah. That, that I have not seen. And I think in the current context, the, the real cause for concern is that as head of the, the ATF, he would have a lot of power to sort of reinterpret the law and impose new restrictions without going to Congress, assuming the courts allow it. And this, this goes to a couple of 
Biden's actual proposals, which which do consist of, of orders to um, the ATF and the Justice Department, uh, of which uh, the ATF is part, uh, to reinterpret law, the law, and impose new restrictions without getting new le new legislation. So one of these proposals is uh, to change the legal treatment of uh, braces that are used with pistols, pistols that they call stabilizing braces, um, which are supposed to help uh, stability and accuracy. Um, and these, according to the ATF, are perfectly legal. Um, the, the legal question is whether a pistol equipped with one of these braces qualifies as a short barreled rifle. If it did, then it would be regulated under the National Firearms Act. You'd have to register with the ATF. You would have to pay a $200 tax. And uh, there would be restrictions on, on how you can transport it and how you can transfer it. Um, so the ATF has repeatedly ruled on this. And they said, no, as long as this is not intended to be fired from the shoulder, which is the part of the legal definition of a rifle, it's not a rifle. Therefore, it's not a short, short barreled rifle. Um, and Biden is saying, uh, he's telling them, no, you need to change that. You need to reverse that position. Um, and his rationale is really solely because of the mass shooting last month in Boulder, where uh, the perpetrator apparently used um, an AR style uh, pistol that was equipped with a stabilizing brace. That's really the only, I mean, he hasn't cited any other cases where that have involved that accessory. It's the only one he talks about. And the idea is that, that assuming it does help with stability and accuracy, that this can make uh, mass shooters more deadly. Uh, now, of course, uh, most mass shooters actually use ordinary handguns, uh, not even you know assault rifles, let alone uh, pistols of this kind. So uh, the importance of that, even in terms of whether it appeals to mass shooters is questionable. But the idea that if you don't have this brace, assuming you could just stop people from having them at all, that that would have any kind of noticeable impact on the frequency of mass shootings or the lethal lethality of mass shootings, that's really hard to buy. But that's his assumption. And so he wants to restrict that accessory, uh, make it harder and more burdensome uh, to possess, and, you know, if you don't register it, you don't pay the tax, then it's subject to confiscation because it's illegal. Um, so that's one thing he wants to do. This is really, I mean, even even more so than uh, so-called assault weapon bans, this is really tinkering at the edges of, of this problem. And this problem, i.e. mass shootings, is, is a tiny percentage, less than 1% of all gun homicides. So the idea that this is going to have any kind of uh, measurable impact is is really dubious. Mm -hmm. That's one one thing he wants to do, and 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 the way he wants to reinterpret the law is really seems to be uh, t to contradict the plain meaning of the statute. Yeah, in fact, on he, that on that point right there about the mass shootings, from the news coverage and just from the number of people dying in any one of them, that seems like maybe it would be a surprising statement to some people, maybe even to me, that really it's only just one percent. But uh, I read a thing a long time ago. I know you know a lot about this, and I wonder if this is also your best information too. I read a thing by a lady who her 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 uh, beat, her journalism beat was covering shootings from coast to coast uh, for years, I think. And she said that essentially Americans kill each other on Friday and Saturday nights when they're drunk. They kill their neighbors and their wives. And that's basically the bulk of of gun homicides in the country. Is that your understanding, too? I'm not sure that that description is fully accurate, but it is certainly true. I mean that that mass shootings account for a fraction of one percent of gun homicides. Mm -hmm. So even though that gets a lot of attention, and it's you know every time uh, a crime like that is committed, politicians like Biden will say this shows why we need more gun control. Um, it's really a, a very very small part of the problem. Yeah. But and, I mean, and, just I guess what it, I'm getting at is it's not even really crime like armed robberies and things like that. It's crimes of passion by people drinking accidents and things they would have never done if you gave them that five minutes back kind of stuff like that is really the bulk I, of it, right? I think that's a substantial part of it, but I, I can't say exactly what percentage. Okay, sure. To, okay, I, I'm sorry. I, go I, ahead. I to, go ahead. I have, to, I have to go and look at that. But so, so this is similar. What, what Biden wants the ATF to do is similar to what uh, the Trump administration had the ATF do with uh, respect to bump stocks. 
uh, the ATF had repeatedly said that uh, this is a legal accessory. It does not make a gun into a machine gun. Um, and then Trump decided he, after the, the mass shooting in Las Vegas that because because the perpetrator there uh, had bump stocks, that this needed to be banned. And rather than going to Congress and 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 asking it to pass a new law, which by the way, people on both sides of that debate both said we Congress needs to act. They assumed that it could not be done administratively, and Trump decided it you know it should be done, and he got the ATF to completely reverse itself in a very implausible way. So this is analogous to that. It's the same sort of thing where you instead of getting Congress to change the law, you unilaterally change the law. So that's troubling in its own terms without regard to its impact on Second Amendment rights. Um, then the other thing he wants to do, that Biden wants to do, is get the Justice Department and the ATF to change the legal treatment of uh, these gun kits that you can use. They have most of what you need to make a gun, does not legally require uh, qualify as a gun, uh, as a firearm, um, but they call them 80% kits, where you get this thing and you have a few steps you have to have to take in order to make a, a, a usable firearm. And again, perfectly legal. Now, um, he wants to, it's not clear whether he wants to ban those kits or restrict them in some way, but if he wants to do that, he needs to get Congress to pass a law that authorizes it. Instead, he's saying the ATF or the, and the Justice Department have to figure out a way to restrict those kits um, uh, so, so that they are either harder to get or impossible to get or whatever, whatever it is that he wants to do. Um, so again, the, the, the legality of that is, is really uh, dubious. Mm -hmm. um, and then go, go beyond the legality of it. Suppose he can do that, right? Suppose he could just ban 80% um, kits um, and so you can't, you can't buy them legally anymore. Is that going to, what kind of impact would that have? Now, what he says is the problem with homemade guns is that they don't have serial numbers. And if it turns up at a, a crime scene, um, police can't trace it, right? So, uh, and he says, if we ban them, it will save lives. And, and you can sort of see, imagine a chain of logic there, which is if it is harder uh, uh, to trace weapons when they don't have serial numbers, if more guns that are used in crimes have serial numbers, you will get a, uh, a higher clearance rate for homicides, and then ultimately this, this will add up to more deterrence and ultimately fewer murders, and that's how you save lives, something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, you know, he doesn't say how common this is, and the evidence I've seen from at least few a few jurisdictions suggests this is not very common at all, that, that, that police are stymied by guns without serial numbers. Um, but that's, that's sort of the basic idea. So, so assuming that that's an issue, right? Assuming that the availability of homemade guns is useful to criminals, and if we could get rid of them, it would make life harder for criminals, um, and make it more likely that, that they would be caught. That'd be right? first I've heard of that being a problem. Yes, it's not. A, it's not. It's clearly not a very significant problem. I mean, based on 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 the surveys I've seen, where they look at how often does this happen. But if it, assuming it's a problem at all. Uh, and you want to try to force all criminals to use guns with serial numbers. That's sort of the idea. Um, can you really do that? No, because if you ban those kits, people can still find the parts that are necessary to make a gun. You can't possibly ban all of those parts. So they might have to take a few more steps. They might have to maybe invest in a 3D printer, which is, you know, they're getting cheaper all the time. Um, uh, but the point is, if somebody's determined to make a gun, whether it's a hobbyist, which is the most common scenario, or actually a criminal who's thinking ahead to when he he leaves his gun at the <laughs> or the crime scene, or when he you know he doesn't uh, dispose of his gun, um, <laughs> you know he's careless in disposing of his gun, and, and so he's thinking I'm going to be careless in that way. Therefore, I want to have a gun without a serial number just in case. Something along those lines. It's not going to stop them, right? Um, so th so so you have both the legal issue: can he do this? Um, or is it a violation of, of se the separation of powers? And I would say it is a violation of the separation of powers. But then secondly, assuming he can do it, what kind of impact would it actually have on public safety? And I would say there's no reason to think it would have a significant impact. Hey, I'll check it out. The Libertarian Institute, that's me and my friends, have published three great books this year. First is No Quarter, The Ravings of William Norman Grigg. He was the best one of us. 
Now he's gone, but this great collection is a truly fitting legacy for his fight for freedom. I know you'll love it. Then there's Coming to Palestine by the great Sheldon Richman. It's a collection of 40 important essays he's written over the years about the truth behind the Israel-Palestine conflict. You'll learn so much and highly value this definitive libertarian take on the dispossession of the Palestinians and the reality of their brutal occupation. And last but not least is the great Ron Paul, the Scott Horton Show interviews 2004 through 2019. Interview transcripts of all of my interviews of The Good Doctor over the years on all the wars, money, taxes, the police state, and more. So how do you like that? Pretty good, right? Find them all at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. Hey guys, here's how to support this show. You can donate in various amounts at scotthorton.org slash donate. We've got some great kickbacks for you there. Shop Amazon.com by way of my link at scotthorton.org. Leave a good review for the show at iTunes and Stitcher. Tell a friend, I don't know. Oh yeah, and buy my books, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and The Great Ron Paul, The Scott Horton Show Interviews 2004 through 2019. And thanks. Um, all right, then the red flag laws. This is something that's going to have a hell of an impact here, there, and in all kinds of unforeseen ways, I'm afraid. Yes. Okay. So th this is something that he wants to do, which I think he can do. I don't think there's any dispute about whether the Justice Department can say, here is a model law a state should adopt. That's what he is proposing. He wants the Justice Department within the next two months to come up with a model law. The problem with that is to the extent that it actually influences the states, it's, it's probably not going to be a good influence. We don't know for sure yet because we haven't seen the details, but uh, these laws are plagued by due process problems. Um, I've you know, done written about this a lot, but, but basically the problem is that people can come forward, allege that someone poses a threat to himself or to others, and judges will automatically issue the initial order. That's the one that they issue without any kind of hearing. And then, uh, at least judging from uh, the data in, in Florida, for example, they almost always issue the second order, which takes away your Second Amendment rights for uh, a year or so, or can, and it can be renewed. Um, and the problem is that People are either either mistakenly think somebody's a danger or maliciously allege that that person's a danger. Um, and if you let all sorts of relatives and acquaintances and school officials, I mean, it varies from state to state. But if you let a long list of people come forward with these complaints and petition a court directly, then you are eliminating this layer of protection where cops and prosecutors might come in and weigh the complaint and say, ah, that doesn't really seem plausible to me. That doesn't really hold up. Now, I don't know how often that actually happens, but that's the theory. The theory of requiring either police or prosecutors to be the ones who apply for these gun confiscation orders is that they will be sort of neutral parties examining these allegations and deciding whether they hold water or not. Now, but one thing Biden did say is that he wants uh, family members or relatives to be able to directly obtain these orders. So that means he's gonna cut out that layer of protection. Now, as to what the uh, standard of proof would be in his, in his model statute, I don't know, but I suspect it's gonna be pretty weak. Uh, as to other, other uh, protections, uh, such as, you know, does, does the target of a gun confiscation order have a right to an attorney if he can't afford one? That's pretty important. Almost no states uh, grant that right. So there are, there are lots of safeguards that, that, that could be included in a red flag law that would make it less likely that innocent, harmless people would lose their Second Amendment rights. But I suspect that whatever model law Biden comes up with is not going to include those safeguards. Yeah. All right. And then was that the last big one? Uh, those were the three that were uh, the main causes for concern, I think, in addition to Chipman's uh, nomination. And then let's say the other two things, one of them was funding for uh, violence prevention programs. I think it was $8 billion in, billion dollars in funding. But that, you know, that is subject to congressional approval. It's part of, uh, what is his latest uh, ex extravagant spending plan called? <laughs> the Amer American Jobs Plan, I believe. Right, so that's part of that plan. 
So Congress would have to approve that. And, and I don't know, you know, some of those programs might actually work or might not work, but at least it's something that he can't do uh, unilaterally. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, and then the other thing is he wants the Justice Department to produce an annual report on firearms trafficking, which again, that's within his power to do. Whether it will have much of an impact or not, I can't say. Mm -hmm. And then um, can you comment about uh, any upcoming legislation about this? Are they going to try to ban AR-15s? Um, yes. I mean, uh, uh, Diane Feinstein has reintroduced yet another revised, supposedly improved version of her assault weapon ban. Biden supports that. Um, and the problem with all laws like, like that one is that they make arbitrary distinctions that don't really go to the question of how effective is this weapon going to be in the hands of a mass shooter, right? So if you say you cannot have a folding um, or adjustable uh, stock, they, which they do, <laughs> you know, if you have, if you have a semi-automatic uh, rifle that accepts a detachable magazine and it's got a folding or adjustable stock, that's a, an assault weapon. So why? I don't know. That's what, <laughs> what they decided. Um, you know, if it has a, uh, a barrel shroud, uh, I think threaded barrel, I think that's still on her list. She removed, if I'm remembering correctly, she's, got, she's done a bunch of, uh, of revisions, so it's hard mm -hmm. to keep track. But I believe uh, that bayonet mounts are allowed now. <laughs> so if you, if you want a bayonet mount, you can have that. It's not an assault weapon. Uh, but she's got uh, uh, grenade launchers which, you know, fine, except you're not, they're not much use without grenades. And grenades are very, you know, hard to get. Civilians will have a hard time getting grenades. They're very strictly regulated under federal law. Um, and, uh, you know, various other features, any one of which transforms this otherwise legal gun into a prohibited assault weapon. Mm -hmm. And just and a so parenthesis there, uh, people might confuse, and in fact, even making this criticism, I stumble to confuse the terms myself. Assault rifle has a very simple definition hold down the trigger, fully automatic. Simple yeah, that. So, I mean, but an assault, assault weapon is like you're talking about. Whatever Dian, Dianne Feinstein finds uh, uncomfortable yeah. to look at, I guess, when she sees it's, a picture it, of one. It is. I mean, an assault weapon literally is whatever politicians say it is. That's the only definition. And so the list of particular features they don't like changes. Mm -hmm. Changes across It's a great bait and switch, though, for the general public because they think we're talking about a law to outlaw fully automatic rifles. Right. No, these are all semi-automatic weapons. That's part of the definition. Um, and uh, Biden himself wrote an op-ed piece for The Times uh, a year or two ago saying, uh, on the one hand, he said the original assault weapon ban was effective. But then he also said the problem with it is that you could modify, manufacturers could modify guns and be compliant with the law, but the guns were still just as lethal. So you might wonder if that's true, <laughs> how it possibly could have had any kind of impact, right, on, on mass shootings. I mean, any impact in terms of how many people were killed, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so he acknowledged that problem, basically, that in principle, there was no way it could have been effective, even leaving aside the fa fact that it grandfathered existing weapons, which, of course, uh, uh, Feinstein's new ban would also grandfather all the millions of, of so-called assault weapons that are already in circulation. Uh, even le leaving that aside, the problem is that, that the laws are based on features that really don't make a significant difference when it comes to how many people you can kill. I mean, like I said, most uh, mass shootings are carried out with ordinary handguns, and you can kill a lot of people with those. Uh, if you look at the the uh, deadliest mass shootings in the United States, uh, many of them were committed with ordinary handguns. So even assuming that you could magically eliminate all the guns that qualify as assault weapons, according to Dianne Feinstein, and that, and she doesn't even purport to do that because, like I said, millions would remain in circulation. But assuming she could make them all disappear, there are plenty of equally lethal alternatives that a mass shooter can use. That's the fundamental problem with those laws. Uh, so, and in fact, there was a, an op-ed piece by, um, a well-known gun control activist, uh, in the times just last week, I believe, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Dan, Dan Gross, I think is his name, um, saying this focus on assault weapons and on mass shootings more generally is, mis is fundamentally mistaken. 
Uh, now, he didn't go so far as to acknowledge that the, the premise of the assault weapon bans is, is uh, illogical, but he did say uh, we shouldn't be talking about that. We should be talking about gun homicides generally, and this is a very tiny percentage of gun homicides. Um, so what, what can we do in order to uh, affect that much broader class of gun homicides? Now, well, one other proposal that actually has passed uh, the House is to um, expand background check requirements for gun buyers, right? And this is very popular. If you look at polling on this, the vast majority of Americans think this is a no-brainer because you have rules about who's allowed to possess firearms. And what uh, these legislators are saying is we just want to enforce those rules better. So they would require background checks for essentially for virtually all uh, transfers, meaning that what would currently be a private sale would have to go through a federally licensed dealer, which means it would have to include a background check. And then they also would extend the amount of time allowed for the background check. Um, but the premise of this, I think, is fundamentally mistaken because it assumes that the current rules about who can own a gun make sense, which they do not. They, are, they uh, disqualify very large groups of people where there's no indication that they are, they have any violent inclinations, right? So if you commit any kind of felony at any point ever, whether it involved violence or not, whether it was actually a predatory crime or not, right? So this could, this includes uh, uh, drug offenses. You, you're never allowed to own a gun. You're never allowed to exercise the right to arm self-defense. Does that make sense? Are these people actually dangerous or not? Uh, uh, similarly, if you've ever been forced to undergo psychiatric treatment as a result of a court order, you may never own a gun legally. Um, so suppose you, uh, you know, uh, relatively early in life, you were deemed suicidal and you were f forced into treatment. Now it's decades later um, and you live in a scary neighborhood and you want to protect yourself. You're not allowed to. So does that make sense, right? Uh, I mean, this is something a point that Amy Coney Barrett has made uh, when she was when she was an appeals court judge, that that the current federal law disqualifies very large groups of people based on criteria that don't really have to do with whether they're a threat to public safety. Oh, one other thing. I, one other thing. I guess I should throw in. This is this is harder for the government um, to measure, but theoretically, if you use marijuana even in a state where it's legal, uh, this also disqualifies you from owning a gun. It's a felony for you to own a gun. It's illegal to sell you a gun if the person who's selling it to you knows that you're uh, a marijuana user. Um, does, you know, does that make any kind of sense? That, I mean, it'd be like saying if you're a drinker, anybody who's a drinker can't ever, own, you know, can't own a gun. Um, this would also apply to people uh, who use uh, prescribed medication that was prescribed for someone else so say your spouse has a prescription for hydrocodone and you hurt your back and you, and you use one of those, you are now an illegal drug user and therefore you're not allowed to own guns. Uh, so so you, can, you get the idea. There is, you have millions and millions of people who are legally disqualified from, from pur purchasing or possessing firearms. And if you make the background uh, check system more comprehensive and more effective, uh, it's going to have it's going to mainly hurt those people who are not really threats to public safety and will it affect criminals? Probably not right because they're yeah. uh, assuming they already have felony records that is qualified for that reason They're already getting their guns in a way that evades background checks. They're going to continue to do that uh, The people who supply them are not going to worry because there's yet another law that says what they're doing is illegal Right. Uh, so that's the whole the premise behind uh, background checks. and one and more that, thing on that. Yeah. I'm sorry, but haven't they sold like 20 or 30 million AR-15s in the last 20 years since the last assault weapons ban expired? And then does that mean that, I guess they're not going to retroactively say everybody has to turn them in, but it means that you have to somehow, everyone's rifles up for inspection to prove when they got it and whether they're grandfathered in or not and all this. And in other words, all AR-15 owners would be presumed guilty until they could prove that they had it before 2021, something like that? It depends on the details of the law. If, under Feinstein's law, if you owned one of the targeted guns before the law takes effect, 
you may continue to possess it. You're not allowed to transfer it because it bans transfer as well as manufacture, right? It bans sales as well as manufacture. Um, Biden's idea was that not only should you ban manufacture and sales going forward, but you should require all existing owners to register their guns with the federal government, right? So that's millions of people who would have to do that. And if they didn't do that, by possessing an unregistered uh, a gun that was covered by this law, they would be committing a felony. Mm. Uh, so uh, Feinstein's bill, at least the last version I saw, does not include a provision like that, but Biden during his campaign said that's what he favored. Man, all right. Listen, I'll let you go with that and and uh, tell you how much I appreciate it because I can't keep up with this stuff, but you do such a great job on it, Jacob. Well, thank you. All right, you guys, that's Jacob Sullum. Senior editor at Reason Magazine. This one is called Joe Biden Learns to Love Gun Control by Presidential Fiat. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.